Former New York Fed President Bill Dudley makes the case for a half-point cut as fresh U.S. data sustains expectations for the Fed to actually trim next week. Now, Boeing's largest union says no to a deal. 33,000 workers are now on strike, adding another headwind for the troubled plane maker. Plus, the Danish company at DSV becomes the world's largest freight forwarder after agreeing to buy Deutsche Bahn's logistic unit. We'll be speaking to Jens Lunds, DSV's chief executive, and that's at 9.30 a.m. UK time. But first thing is first, there's a lot going on in the market, so let's get straight to European markets map. Again, it's a big central bank week. It has been because of the ECB. Next week will be an even bigger one because of Fed. Now, the CAC 40 can see two tenths of eight percent higher. Similar gains for the DAX. The FTSE here is actually practically unchanged. Now, cross assets, there's an interesting thing, and we'll spend a little bit of time talking actually about gold. So, I look at two things. First of all, euro dollar. This is probably a bit of a Fed story, but also um, a euro story on the back of the ECB. I'm very happy to be speaking all about this with Emil Fiotakis. And then S&P futures practically unchanged. Gold, you can see on the rise, 2000 569. Now, Boeing factory workers also walked off the job, crippling manufacturing across the plane makers. Seattle commercial jet hubs, members of its largest union, actually rejecting a contract offer and voted to strike. The walkout began at midnight Seattle time, and you can see a Boeing down 3.1% pre market. So, for the conversations that matter and the insights you need, let's get started. and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Joining us now, Themos Fitakis, Global Head of FX and Macro Strategy at Barclays. Paul Dobson, our Executive Editor for Asia Markets, also joins us. Good morning to you both. Themos, there's a lot going on. When you look at Fed expectations, are they getting too, too much ahead of themselves or is not enough priced in? No, I think that they are probably going a little bit ahead of themselves, at least re re relative to what we know now, and more importantly for FX, relative to other central banks, including the ECB. Um, yes, the economy is slowing, and yes, we are at this period of time where the market is just trying to calibrate exactly how much the Fed will cut by, but our take on the overall economy is not for some kind of emergency, kind of quick, fa fast-paced cutting cycle. Uh, and Paul, what's going on actually with gold today? Uh, I think gold is getting a lift based on those Fed expectations. It seems like a dollar down day uh, pretty much across the board. We also saw that reflected in Asian uh, strength today uh, across the currency markets. And I think that calculus is, uh, you know, just as we got to the point where pretty much everybody was expecting that the Fed would do a 25 basis point cut, along comes that slight possibility that they'll do 50 again. And that weighed on short term yields in the Asia market session and, and weighed on the dollar as well and gave gold that big boost as a result. I mean, Themos, look, as you say, the Fed is likely to cut rates uh, next week. What's your view on the rate path afterwards? Is that a lot more uncertain? And what does that mean for the dollar? Well, first of all, let's just say that whether they do 25 or 50, it's going to have a near-term impact, but it's not going to change the course of humanity. Uh, to remind, it's, <laughs> it is good to remind markets that. Yeah. And the second thing I would say is that to us, um, committing to a 50 base points pace, because if you start 50, you're not going to be doing just 150 probably, right? Um, committing to, it's not, it's unnecessary. And also like Bullard said, you know, what's the point in that? You can always accelerate later if the data deteriorates. So we are uh, sort of like in the 25 base points camp. But even if they did the 50, right? There was a point in time around the, fa the payrolls report where the market briefly priced three times 40 cuts for this year. And euro dollar was at that point a little bit above 111. So I doubt that we're going to have an enormous impact on the 50. And, and Paul, I know that there's, of course, a, we'll go back to actually some of the, the dollar reads. But actually, when you look at yen and what the Bank of Japan has made or hasn't made clear, how will that, Paul, drive markets forward? I think that that's one of the crucial uh, currency crosses to watch out for. The Bank of Japan, of course, uh, still hiking at the same time as all the rest of the central banks around the developed world are cutting interest rates. And so that is giving the yen that support relative to uh, the dollar and relative to other currencies as well. Now, uh, surveys are suggesting that the most likely time for the BOJ to do the next hike is December. Uh, we do have a meeting coming up. 
uh, very soon and we might get a little bit more of a steer on that. The next most favourite month is October and if we do see the BOJ leaning into that some more as a big possibility then uh, it may give the yen some more strength and we're seeing that in the FX option space in trading this week. There's been uh, people picking up those, uh, those opportunities to try and um, capture the risk of a stronger yen uh, over, over the coming trading sessions. Uh, Themos, have we seen the worst of the yen carry trade and winding, or is there still more to come? I think that in terms of the very sort of like forced nature of the selling of the market, I think that a lot of that is behind us. Yeah. Now, if you think about the fact that the Japanese typically invest abroad, if we were in a setup where there's a lot of repatriation, there could be some of that. But I think that the worst of the forced carry trade unwind is far behind us. If anything, speculative positions are now long yen. What do you think overall is the most underestimated risk in the currency markets? At the moment, mm -hmm. I think that one of the most underestimated risks in the currency market is tariffs and China. Uh, we are a little bit ahead of the election. Asian currencies are trading strong. There is the risk of a, I mean, whatever mm -hmm. probability you give to that, of a 60% tariff looming, which would have an enormous impact, I think, on the economy and on the currency market, which is not priced. All right, uh, Themos, thank you so much. Uh, Paul Dobson, Bloomberg's executive editor for Asia Markets. Thank you, as always. More from Themos Fiotakis from Barclays shortly. Now, Bloomberg has also learned that the ECB governing council members believe they aren't yet in a position to rule out a rate cut at their next meeting in October. Now, this comes as policymakers weigh any downturn in the economy as underlying inflation projections nudge higher. The risks to economic growth remain tilted to the downside. Lower demand for euro area exports, owing, for instance, to a weaker world economy or an escalation in trade tensions between major economies, would weigh on euro area growth. Well, joining us now is Lizzie Burden, who's in Frankfurt for us. Good morning, Lizzie. So where does the cut to growth forecast actually leave interest rates in October? Well, this is the big question, Francine. Do they squeeze in another cut in October before going back to this quarterly pace of quarter point cuts? And markets don't see it as very likely. They've cut the chance of an October cut from 40% before the meeting to 20% now. And that's despite the dovish signals. You had, as you say, the cut to the growth forecast this year and in the years ahead. The fact that Lagarde said the risks to growth are tilted to the downside, but didn't mention a bias on inflation. And then this morning, the ECB speak, Muller saying that confidence is growing, that inflation is slowing. Wren saying he sees question marks around the growth outlook. Nagel saying he sees inflation calming down. Simka saying more cuts must happen. But then Vilroy and Muller flagging the inflation risks. Of course, as well yesterday, Christine Lagarde very much sticking to this data dependent, meeting by meeting messaging, saying essentially don't overreact to individual data points because inflation could come down but it could go back up yeah. again so at the moment it seems that economists and markets are agreed october doesn't look likely but as you say officials emphatically not ruling it out lizzie thanks so much lizzie burden there in frankfurt let's get back to themos themos we also heard from francois villeroy de gallo the french uh, central banker today basically saying you know we must be very careful not to overshoot and undershoot inflation because it's their only mandate but it's very difficult to calibrate it given geopolitics and given all the uncertainty with oil as well for me i think that the risks are more tilted to the downside in terms of european rates in terms of the european outlook and as a house as well Europe is being hit by slowing China growth, by a trade war which is not, ha is not going to happen. It's already happening. It's years now happening. We see that in a number of sectors getting affected by what China is doing. And this is going to continue. It's going to extend regardless of who is the next uh, U.S. president. Ongoing escalation will continue. You have domestic demand which is hit by higher rates. Uh, and it's pretty clear that there are very transitory factors around inflation which are uh, likely to uh, abate. So for me, I cannot understand how we are in a setup where we're debating a series of 50s for the Fed. Yeah. But for the ECB, we're very ambivalent, basically, as a market. But so, do you, so why is that, actually? Is it just because there's a perception in Europe that inflation could pick up or there's not an overheating of the economy? No, I think that to some degree... 
um, you need a stronger message from the ECB to some degree, I think. And I think the biggest issue with the ECB, which is, confounds people and it's puzzling, is that the countries that are most challenged in growth outlook and are likely to have the biggest challenges also in terms of how growth filters to inflation are the ones that are the most hawkish at the moment. So it's the most confusing bit, I would say. What does it mean for euro? Um, I think it's just the, a matter of timing in terms of the realization that European rates in real terms, for instance, are quite high versus where the U.S. rates are priced at the moment. And that probably means that beyond the near term euro strength, which could extend for a couple of months, euro dollar is probably going lower in 12 months out. But Themis, so when you look at interest rates and where they should be in, in 18 months, is that a good benchmark? And are we going to see a, a big rate differential between ECB and Fed? I think that differential has narrowed down a lot. So, for instance, if you look at 10-year real rate differentials between Europe and the U.S., it's the tightest it has been in the last two years. Uh, but that, to me, I think that there will be a point in time, the next, the first couple of cuts, where U.S. growth will stabilize, where the outlook will stabilize, that will get repriced higher, and the challenges for Europe will remain, and their outlook will get repriced lower, and the wedge between the two will widen. Why are markets not starting to think about, I mean, the, you know, the Trump is talk, President Trump is talking about possibly debasing the dollar. We talked or we worry about possible uh, Fed independence being put in question if he becomes president. The market doesn't latch on to that at all. Is it because it's far-fetched or because they don't know how to trade it? I think the costs to having the, Trump interfere with the dollar is, are very high for him. Uh, so he can actually do fiscal retrenchment, which he won't do. He can actually issue uh, debt to buy foreign assets, which is unfathomable in the U.S. context. Interfering with the Fed, his appointments, his selected appointments in his first presidency got shot down by Republican Senate. So it doesn't seem that it's the easiest thing to do. Okay, thank you so much. As thank always, Stemos, Stemos Fiotak is very global head of FX and macro strategy at Barclays. Now, we're just getting a big piece of news. Um, well, I'll try and figure out exactly what it means, but it, China is now finding PwC and has halted operations over its Evergrande audit. I mean, Evergrande is something that we've been talking about for quite some time, and I think at some point Chinese policymakers had actually employed PwC come and have a look. They were basically parachuted in um, to, to run this scandal hit business. And at the moment, just in the last couple of seconds, China has fined PwC, but also halted operation over these audits. We'll have plenty more news when uh, they break through the Bloomberg terminal. And as soon as I have them, I'll give them to you. Now, Adobe plunged post-market after its revenue forecast failed to reflect an AI uplift. Oracle also surging as investors cheered its long-term sales target. The company expects its annual revenue to rise to at least $104 billion in fiscal 2029. So you can see actually Adobe down 8%, Oracle gaining almost 5.8%. Coming up, Boeing's Seattle workers ignore a plea for peace from new chief executive Kelly Ortberg, downing tools for the first time since 2000. And eight, we get the latest on this developing story. That's next, and this is Bloomberg. Now, Boeing's factory workers have walked off the job for the first time in 16 years this morning, crippling manufacturing across the plane maker's Seattle commercial jet hub. Now, it comes after members of its largest union rejected a contract offer and voted to strike. For more on this developing story from, of course, let's bring in Bloomberg Aviation reporter Danny Lee. Danny, thank you for joining us, as always. So what's at stake for Boeing, really? Yeah, good morning, friends. So, you know, this is a new low for Boeing, frankly, given the pressures it has financially after what has happened over the last several months, particularly all stemming back to this Alaska Airlines door blowout. These unhappy workers, 33,000 of them, is a resounding vote of rejecting this, this deal that Boeing had thought it had negotiated a good deal with its union leadership. So where do we go from here? Well, frankly, we're only hours into a strike, the first strike in 16 years. And so for the factory, the biggest factory for building its commercial jets out of Seattle, down in tools and therefore no new planes will can be finished and be built and no planes can be handed over to airline customers around the world. And that puts pressure on Boeing because it can't take in the cash from 
all the planes that he's building, all the costs that goes into them. And so for a new CEO, Kelly Otberg, that pressure, not just on getting a new deal, a new negotiation settlement for uh, the unions that they'll be happy with, investors as well, as we see pre-market uh, Boeing stock being down. And then also for airline customers who'll be angry that yet another piece of disruption is hitting them and the fact that they may not need now receive planes as uh, when they said they would, which has already been delayed. So, Danny, what, what exactly, I mean, how much impact could this have? What kind of disruptions? And you were mentioning the new chief executive. I mean, this must put them under a lot of pressure. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, and I think that now that with Boeing, the uh, new CEO, he has come in, been parachuted in to try and uh, clean things up for Boeing, uh, he, he now has a chance to try and fix things and show how good he is in, in getting a new settlement. You know, this was not necessarily his deal, but one where he can now come in and try and put things right, something that has been long in the making for 16 years. Danny, thank you so much for the terrific update. Our Bloomberg Aviation reporter there, Danny Lee. Coming up, new capital rules for UK banks. We'll hear from Sam Woods, Deputy Governor of the BOE and head of its regulatory arm. That's next, and this is Bloomberg. Now, the Bank of England says it has made significant changes to plans for bank capital rules that will mean key requirements are virtually unchanged for UK lenders. Now, I asked Sam Woods, the head of the BOE's regulatory arm, about the response from the industry. The main objective of the package, both here and elsewhere in the world, is to make sure that we're measuring risk correctly in the banking system, and it makes a number of improvements in that regard. But it does do two other things, which I think both of them are relevant to your question. One, it shows that the UK is a strong upholder of global standards because this package will meet the standards set by the Basel Committee. That's very important for financial stability and cross-border trade. But also, we have had close regard to UK competitiveness and growth, and we've made a number of targeted changes to speak to that point. And just stepping back one pace, if I might, this is also the first major piece of banking regulation we've done since we left the EU. And I hope what people will see is we're taking a balanced approach. So... We're resolute in maintaining financial stability, having a strong banking system, but we're also very mindful of competitiveness and growth issues and we'll accommodate those to the extent that we can. Do you think this actually does make UK banks more competitive? I think it, there, there are some changes that we've made versus what we've proposed on which definitely go in that direction. And in particular, uh, there were quite strong concerns expressed about the plan we had to remove something called the EU support factor for SMEs. Mm -hmm and for infrastructure, and we will remove that, but we'll make an offsetting adjustment in another part of our capital requirements, which I think is just a more intelligent way to handle it. So it's things of that kind where we've moved. So it, does it, it coincides also with the new government in charge. Did that come into your thinking, or was it lobbying from, from banks? Well, look, I mean, of course, banks lobby extensively on a thing like this, and yet lobbying is sometimes used as a dirty word, but this is a part of the policy process that people have an interest get engaged. Uh, our approach to that is we're interested in evidence. So where banks bring us convincing evidence that we've got it wrong, then we act. Great example of that is we've also done a thing on trade finance. So we've reduced something called the conversion factors, which is how much undrawn commitment, if you like, clients of banks might pull down mm -hmm. when certain things happen. And you know, we've gone out with, with one level and the banks gave us some evidence which was very convincing, actually, that that was overcooked for trade finance. So we made that change. Now, that's also good. I think for UK growth and competitiveness, but it you know, has to be based on the evidence. But since 2017, because this was the last set of rules, how have banks changed? And do you see more risk going into, for example, shadow banking and unregulated parts of the financial industry? So it, it is true and oft discussed that there's plenty of risk outside the banking system. And you know, sometimes that blows up on its own. Sometimes it blows up, as in the you know, case of Archegos, for instance, which was around the time you were talking about, and brings a big hit back into the banking system. So we have to be aware of that from a macro prudential point of view on its own grounds and from a micro prudential point of view in terms of its impact on the banks. Um, but look, let's not forget that you know, the banking system serves its purpose partly by taking some risk. And so you know, we shouldn't forget there is also significant risk in the banking system. And this package does not increase the overall amount of capital by very much at all. But what it does do is move the capital around within the banking system so that it's in a better place.
But this makes UK banks more competitive compared to the US. And we had a number of proposals also from the US this week. Were you briefed uh, ahead of it so that you, you could almost calibrate? So we've been in close touch with our US colleagues at all levels in our organization, including, including at mine. And we have been talking, as you and you would imagine. I think it's very helpful that Michael Barr made his speech on Tuesday of this week, um, both because I think you know, the substance, you know, at least to me, looks very sensible. Um, but also, perhaps more importantly, from our point of view, there's a very clear commitment from our US colleagues to go ahead. And this is an international agreement. Only works if everyone plays. Well, that was Sam Woods, the chief executive of the Prudential Regulation Authority, talking to me about the BOE's new bank capital reforms. Coming up, we'll be speaking to the chief executive officer of DSV, which has agreed to purchase Deutsche Bank's logistic business for over 14 billion euros. That conversation is up next, and this is Bloomberg. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francis Lacqua here in London, and these are your top stories. Former New York Fed President Bill Dudley makes the case for half a point cut as fresh U.S. data sustains expectations for the Fed to trim next week. Boeing's largest union says no to a deal. 33,000 workers are now on strike, adding another headwind for the troubled playmaker. Plus, the Danish company DSV becomes the world's largest freight forwarder after agreeing to buy Deutsche Bahn's logistic unit. We'll be speaking to Jens Lund, DSV's chief executive, in just a moment. Also, a story that we broke about 20 minutes ago. Uh, China has actually halted some of PricewaterhouseCoopers business for six months in the country for its role in auditing China Evergrande Group. Now, the company, we understand, was fined some $62 million. That's according to statements from the Finistry, the Ministry of Finance over in China. PwC definitely under the spotlight after China launched one of the biggest investigations of financial fraud in history. Now, the other story we're watching out for is Boeing. Uh, factory workers there have walked off the job, crippling manufacturing across the plane maker's Seattle commercial jet hub. Well, members of the largest union re rejected a contract offer and voted to strike. The walkout began at midnight Seattle time. DSV has now agreed to buy a Deutsche Bahn unit in a 14.3 billion dollar billion euro deal, actually, that will turn the Danish company into one of the world's largest logistics companies. I think we're joined by Jens Lund, the chief executive of DSV. Thank you, Mr. Lund. I'm so happy um, to see you online. So first of all, congratulations on the deal. It's a massive deal. And thank you for joining us today. So what are your main objectives strategically with this deal? Our main objectives with it, and uh, thank you for having me here, first of all, and uh, our main objectives uh, is to create basically the world's uh, strongest uh, player in our industry. We're going to be a, a global leader, and uh, with the combination of uh, D.B. Schenker and uh, DSV, we will have uh, basically uh, the best service offering in our industry. Mm -hmm. So can you quantify any synergies or any loss of commercial opportunities? I don't know if certain clients, because of the overlap, will go elsewhere. How do you quantify these right now? Normally, when we uh, integrate companies, we manage to get the uh, efficiency of these uh, companies up to our level. And this means that, uh, of course, at, at the end of the day, uh, there will be... Uh, uh, basically uh, job cuts. Uh, it's not something that we've detailed 100% uh, out right now, uh, so we'll be able to give specific numbers later on. Uh, and uh, I think when it comes to uh, top line, actually I believe that once our customers experience the stronger offering we have, we will actually be able to grow our volume and uh, we will not uh, 
uh, lose volume. Uh, it might be that there will be uh, some customers where we have too large a share of wallet in the integration, uh, but that uh, is part of our planning and we should soon be able to overcome that. So, um, Mr. Lund, what do you see as a financial outlook for the new company? Again, do you know how much revenue you're expecting to increase in coming years? Yeah, if you look at the company right now, we will have uh, approximately 40 billion euros in uh, in revenue. Uh, and uh, that can dip a little bit, but then we're going to grow faster uh, later on. So I think we will probably uh, pretty soon uh, be about uh, or above the, the 300 billion uh, DKK or 40 billion euros uh, in revenue and then grow faster uh, than the market. This has been uh, normal when we acquire companies that uh, this happens. And uh, we also expect that this will be the case for the DB Schenker deal. Wait, do you have any plans to shut down units? I know you mentioned maybe early days, but job cuts seem to have been one of the tricky points in negotiating this. So what's your deal with that? Yeah, normally when we integrate it's two network businesses, you would have a global network and you would also have uh, domestic networks as well. And of course, you have to combine those units. Uh, and uh, in this process, we invest in new modern infrastructure uh, so that we get the productivity up. It needs to be higher than we have today. Uh, and of course, as a result of this, in, in sort of in the transitional phase, uh, there will be uh, a requirement to uh, lay off uh, staff, uh, but then once we've plateaued and we've uh, set the new organization, we can then uh, continue uh, growing. How long do you think that will, take? Think that will take? Are we talking, you know, 12 months or, or several years? Uh, an integration like this, uh, the majority of the work will be done within two, three years. Uh, mm -hmm. Then it's only the things where you really require, you know, significant uh, physical infrastructure to be uh, constructed. Apart from that, it will take uh, two to three years to uh, complete the uh, integration. This is uh, sort of the normal time horizon. We will inform about how the organization is set up uh, sooner. Uh, so that people, they know uh, what can be expected. It's always the uncertainty in such a phase that is uh, very difficult. And we want to do our best, like we've done on other transactions as well, to shorten that uh, time period uh, so that people have certainty uh, what is uh, going to happen to my role. Is DSV then open for acquisitions after this? Yeah, it's uh, it's been part of our journey. It's it's a capability we have. It's very often difficult for companies uh, to do this with success. Actually, we have managed to do this uh, several times uh, before and uh, with a very high degree of success. So when you have that competence, I think it's also an obligation to uh, to use it. The company is um, right now. Uh, the market leader, uh, once the, the mm -hmm. transaction has been uh, approved, we have six to seven percent global market share. So it's in a highly fragmented market. And it is like other markets, then you have, uh, when you consolidate, uh, you simply have a better offering. And then uh, you also have the economies of scale, so you become more efficient. And these sort of when you this will create productivity and this productivity is as you know wealth that can be distributed both to our shareholders to our employees but it will certainly also benefit uh, the industries we serve our customers they really rely on uh, a supply chain that functions i guess after covid everybody's aware of of this mm -hmm. and uh, this will surely uh, be uh, strengthening the capabilities that are available uh, Mr. Lynch, are you concerned at all that DB's supervisory board could still veto the deal or any concerns in the integration in these early stages? Yeah, I think, you know, uh, there's always a, a risk, uh, but uh, I see both the uh, the board of, of, of Deutsche Bahn and also the government in, in Germany, uh, they're very competent and uh, professional, uh, just like we are. So when we are at this stage of the transaction, uh, 
we expect that everybody will uh, live up to the agreements we have made and uh, there's always then this specific thing when uh, you have many stakeholders and uh, there's a little bit uh, what can I say, different focus from some of the stakeholders uh, mm -hmm. looking after their constituents. But after all, we consider uh, our counterparty to be very professional. Thank you so much for your time today. It was a real pleasure to, to interview you and hopefully get to know you a little bit better uh, as this deal goes through. Jens Lund, the chief executive of DSV. Now, coming up, we're interviewed with renowned economist, businesswoman and author Dambisa Moyo. We'll talk about the economy. We'll talk about what it's like being on boards. That's next, and this is Bloomberg. Back everyone now the Federal Reserve is poised to cut rates for the first time in more than four years next week as inflation continues to cool and the labor market slows. Now investors remain divided on the size of the cut with former New York Fed Reserve Bank President William Dudley arguing that there's still scope for a half point adjustment. Now this comes after the ECB reduced its deposit rate by 25 basis points yesterday, the second such move this year. Now to dissect all of this, I'm delighted to be joined by renowned economist and author Dumbiza Moyo whose most recent book is How Boards Work and How They Can Work Better in a Chaotic World. Dumbiza, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you you understand central banks. You're in the House of Lords. You speak to politicians. There's a little bit of a dichotomy about what the, the Fed says and does and actually what markets believe. And then there's a third wheel, which is what businesses are doing. Like, what are we misunderstanding in the U.S.? Well, I think fundamentally there's still a lot of uncertainty that's exogenous to what the Fed is looking at. I mean, obviously they have their data and they understand the exogenous risks. But, I mean, just to, to be absolutely clear, I'm, when I err on the side of go for 25 basis points, why get aggressive? And I understand um, very compelling arguments that it should have been, a cut should have come in July. But that notwithstanding, there's so much geopolitical risk. risk there's local risk in the United States with the election. Um, there's deglobal issues that are continuing and we've seen escalation um, in both of the big wars that are happening right now it just seems to me plus on top of that by the way the consumer is weaker especially at the lower levels of income this and there are concerns about um, inflation still ticking up and core inflation and services so why not just go for 25 and, and wait and see it just seems to me to be the obvious thing but Debisa, at the same time there's this like elusive soft landing which we don't 100 percent knows what it means it's like it's something not ugly happening yes. I guess in the economy yeah. Can we be so sure of that? And if you go 25 basis points, does it really make a difference to the trajectory of the economy if it's 25 or 50 at the next meeting? Well, I think 50 to me feels more aggressive. Um, I, and I, you're absolutely right. There have been a number of announcements in the last several weeks of layoffs, um, at, even at 4.2% 4, uh, 4 on unemployment. This, the mood music seems to be cooling down. And you, you can see that in um, discretionary spending as also with the non-discretionary spending in particular. So um, I'm not at all saying that there isn't a slowdown coming. The inversion of the curve, two tens inverted. I mean, I think those are all signs that there could be a recession. Could it's certainly a slowdown. Um, and I, it's a, but to my mind, um, as uh, decision makers, and if you, whether you're allocating capital or you're making public policy decisions, you should really not be going more aggressive than need be. And I think it's not the end of the world. There, there will be more opportunities to cut more aggressively if need be. But there's just too many exogenous factors. It feels to me. But again, so uh, you know, there, there seems to be a feeling also that we shouldn't worry about inflation anymore. And I guess, as you point out, because of trade concerns, because of the U.S. election, we could really change the way that we trade and also uh, the dollar could possibly debase, although that's, yes. that's quite difficult to yeah. do technically. Yeah. But what, again, are we underestimating the risk of inflation coming I back up? I think we are. Um, I, so, you know, there's no doubt about it. I've, I've been going to Jackson Hole for several years. And, um, you know, I think Jay Powell a couple of years ago was, was very patently clear about how long it takes to really purge the system from inflation. We've done incredibly well. They 
they've done well. We are at a place now in, in Europe, in the UK and in the US, we're close to those 2 percent. But that we should not be naive about what the sources of inflation are and that those risks still exist. Um, it seems to me that, uh, you know, if anything, and I've been talking a little bit about this uh, for the last several months, that um, we could actually see infl more inflation in the, in the financial markets. Uh, you know, and there's that argument. PE multiples are higher, um, the frothy markets, the whole Minsky argument, you get more stability, people start to borrow more. I mean, we have to balance these, um, these risks. So, I, I, sure, we're out of the sort of aggressive woods um, about inflationary pressure, but I wouldn't be so naive as to say, oh, it's completely stamped out and there's no risk. We have a war going on. And sure, even energy prices, looking at WTI and Brent, you know, below $70, that's all comforting in some respects. And I know that there's some, I think Macquarie has a forecast of <laughs> going to $50, but that could change at a dime. Yeah, and, and actually, yeah. we don't know. I mean, how, how do you look at Trump policies? Um, and how do you make a difference between what's being said at the moment and will actually be done if he becomes president and what that means for fragmentation, globalization, and dollar debasing? Yeah, and so I'm um, the vice chair of the Economic Club of New York. And last Thursday, we hosted President Trump. Um, it was an offer to both candidates, and President Trump took it up, and he came to the Economic Club for lunch. And um, it, it sounded to me, a, a lot of the tariff policies that he's been very explicit about in particular um, are um, net inflationary to consumers. I mean, I know he has his arguments as why that, that might not be the case, but I think fundamentally in the U.S., um, and, you know, he's definitely pursuing or thinking about pursuing those more aggressive inflationary processes. Is, is there any doubt in your mind that it will be much more difficult if he's in power for the rest of the world economically? So the fundamental problem is that we have a growth situation, um, weakness of growth around the world. And, um, and so, you know, is it going to be much more a, a protectionist uh, world? We're already in that world. I mean, in fact, Bloomberg argued that in 2009 was the peak trade um, protectionism. Um, I think that where there might be new elements of protectionism are in the military and the national security spheres. And that's what people, I think, perhaps would say is are, are new risks. Um, I, I'm not a national security expert to speak more of that. But if you think about capital flows, immigration, um, these are big economic pillars of globalization. We've already seen a, a sort of a de decapitalization or the deglobalization in these areas. From a, from a, a corporate board perspective, um, we've already been talking about this more siloed world. What does it yeah. mean for capital allocation? What does it mean for operations? What does it mean for, um, for, pro for procurement? Um, and, and we've already started to make those type of adjustments. So I think it's an escalation of, of, of a sort of Trump world of a more deglobalization. Adambiza, thank you so much. We'll come back. Actually, we'll talk a little bit, I guess, in the, you know, from the theory to the practical. What does it mean for boards and companies yes. having to make difficult decisions yes. uh, shortly? Adambiza Moyo there stays with us. Also coming up, our interview with Wilbur Ross, former U.S. Secretary of Commerce, under Donald Trump's first administration. That's coming up shortly. And this is Bloomberg. That's the other thing that was slow under Biden. They have a great deal of difficulty implementing acts once they've been passed. So in the case of this CHIPS Act, it was two years after Congress passed it and President Biden signed it. It was two years before they committed the first money. That left us exposed for another two years to the vulnerability of being an importer of 75% of all the semiconductors that we use. So I'm glad it finally got enacted. I'm glad it finally got appropriated. And I'm glad they finally implemented it. But that left us vulnerable for two more years than we need to be. We talk a lot about the value of the dollar. Do you think it's too weak or too strong right now for the U.S. to really thrive economically? Well, I think the U.S. is heading toward probably a very mild uh, recessionary period. And that shouldn't be too surprising. It was artificially propped up by all the great situations that had prevailed and all the cash that was pumped into the economy in the aftermath of COVID. I, I think they overdid that. And particularly, they overdid it in the sense that 
that money didn't go into productive use. All of that money went into the hands of people who immediately spent it. So it increased demand by a lot, by trillions of dollars, but it didn't do anything to increase supply. So I, I believe that monetary phenomenon is really what caused the big inflation. Well, that's Wilbur Ross, a former U.S. Secretary of Commerce under Donald Trump's first administration and a veteran of Wall Street, speaking to me ahead of the launch of his book, Risks and Returns, Creating Success in Business and Life. Well, welcome back to economist and author Dembiza Moyo. Uh, she's written also many books, so she knows what it's like to get a book out there and then uh, try to analyze the world economy. Let's talk about what you do best, which is actually you sit on many boards and you translate all of these economics theory geopolitics and what it means for okay, on the ground decision level when you know for boards are they thinking longer term enough it's a great question, um, and I would argue that the, it, because of the complexity of the world, because of deglobalization, because of a higher cost of capital, um, I, fundamentally the, the horizon has shifted shorter. Um, I think you know it, it is the case that one of the mandates of a corporate board is to look further out into the future, think about taking long-term bets regionally, sectorally, in terms of technology, um, how do you operate, etc. But I think fundamentally, because of all the changes that I just outlined. Um, we are seeing more complexity, and a more complex world makes it much, much more difficult to make bets. Um, and so we are still focused, and all the boards I'm involved with, on capital discipline, oh. thinking about how to allocate that marginal dollar in an effective way, mm -hmm. um, thinking about operational excellence at the time of these massive juggernauts in energy transition as well as uh, as, as AI. But, I mean, it, it is a very tricky uh, thing to be to making these bets and, and when your horizon is shorter um, and thinking about what that appropriate discount rate must be. Dembiza, you're also a member, of course, of the House of Lords, so you understand the UK, you know, UK PLC, UK yes. businesses quite closely. What do they need from the new government come October 30th? So um, we definitely needed an, a reset, and so political uh, stability is always going to be a good thing. But I think we need to move quite quickly into a, uh, into an, a narrative coming from political leadership that this is a place to invest. Without investment, the country is going nowhere, um, and this is really important for growth. It's really important for some of the uh, hopes that we have in terms of improving productivity through the adoption of, of technology and AI, which the Prime Minister was talking about yesterday vis-à-vis uh, -vis the NHS. But it's also critically important to, to attract not just foreign direct investment, it's also attracting local investment. The key pillar investors like pension funds, insurance organizations, endowments, they're underinvested in this economy. Um, you know, the chancellor, former Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, Jeremy Hunt, has talked about this. Others are is very familiar that um, in 1992, about 30 percent of uh, pension assets were for UK, uh, UK pensions were invested in the UK. And today, that number is around 1.6 to 1.9 percent. Um, that's unacceptable. It's a bad um, signal to foreign investment. And this is not the time to, to be thinking about those negative things. But so, Debbie, if there's one thing that would make a huge difference, actually, in that budget, October you know, 30th, again, is it some of the softer skills on how you portray it? Or is there actually a, a, you know, a financial incentive that well, should be in there? Look, I think uh, you know, one of the classic examples, everybody, wherever you are, we know that there's going to be some changes to capital gains. I mean, no. It doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or Republican in the United States or indeed here in the UK. We've, it's, everybody has pledged that there's going to be that change. I I think the magnitude of the change will matter. I think um, also how it's spun. Um, so we're going to have all these massive changes, but what does this actually mean for jump-starting the economy? So the narrative is going to be very important and what comes next. Dumbisa, as always, thank you so much for joining us. That was Dumbisa Moyo uh, joining us. And, of course, uh, we'll, get, we'll, we'll keep an eye on everything that's happening in the UK and we'll have Dumbisa back. Up next, Bloomberg Brief, Danny Berger, Manus Cranny in New York, and this is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.